Welcome to another class on Christology. Another class on Christology. And this is the last video class we are going to have. I'm going to be giving you assignments to do to make up for the 36 hours. Okay. Let us pray. Father, forgive me of my sins. Glorious Father, it is in the name of Jesus Christ, the blessed Lord, and on the basis of his finished work at Calvary, that I approach all the presence. I have no merit of my own. In me that is in my flesh, there is nothing good. But you are good, you are great, you are God, you are mighty. I pray, my God, that you take control of me. I pray, my God, that you bless me and uphold me with a righteous right hand. Blessed Father, pray, lead me in path of righteousness and holiness. Blessed Father, pray, you bless participants in this course and those who are in this class. I pray you build courage upon this system now engage to make this class possible. Amen. We have been looking at the day of worship, the Sabbath. Days of worship, you know, we start with the Sabbath, and we're looking at the Lord's Day. <coughs> the Lord's Day are the day on which believers worship, which is Sunday. That day commemorates two things. Commemorates two things. In addition to the fact that the Sabbath is nowhere imposed on the children of God, on the grace, there are abundant reasons for their observance of the first day of the week. There are many reasons for our observance of the first day of the week. One, a new day prophesied and appointed according to the to Psalm. 118 verse 22 to 24 and Acts 4 10 to 11 Christ in his crucifixion was his stone rejected by Israel the builders but through his resurrection he has been made the headstone of a corner that is a new building the church city church believers as a new building this marvelous thing is of God, and the day of its accomplishment is divinely appointed as a day of rejoicing and of gladness. In accord with this, Christ's greeting on the resurrection morn was all hail, Matthew 20, 28, 9, which is more literally, O oh, have joy, and being the day which the Lord hath made, it is rightfully termed the Lord's Day. That's number one. Number two, observance indicated by various events. On the first day, Christ arose from the dead, Matthew 28, 1. On that day, he first met his disciples in the new intimacy of fellowship, John 20, verse 19. On that day, he gave them instruction, Luke 24, 36, 49. On that day, he ascended into heaven as the first fruits or wave sheave. John 20, verse 17. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. Leviticus 23, 10 to 12. On that day, he breathed the Spirit on them. John 20, verse 22. On that day, the Spirit descended from heaven. Acts, same day. Acts 2, 1 to 4. On that day, the Apostle Paul preached in Troas. Acts 20, verses verse 6 to 7. On that day, they were to lay by in store as God had prospered them. That's the tithe and offering. Second, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Okay. Now, we're looking at reasons why 
believers saved by grace are to observe Sunday as their day of worship. Number three, the day of circumcision. The rite of circumcision which was performed on the eighth day typified the believer's separation from the flesh and the old order by the death of Christ. Colossians 2.11 And the eighth day being the first day after a completed week is symbolical of a new beginning. Number four, the day of grace. At the end of a week of toil, a day of rest was granted to the people who were related to God by law works. Whereas to the people under grace whose works are finished in Christ, a day of worship is appointed which being the first day of the week precedes all days of work. In the blessing of the first day, the believer lives and serves the following six days. A day of rest belongs to a people who are related to God by works needing to be accomplished. A day of ceaseless worship and service belongs to a people who are related to God by the finished work of Christ. We are related to God by the finished work of Christ, not, not by our works. The seventh day was characterized by unyielding law. The first day is characterized by the latitude and liberty belonging to grace. The seventh day was observed with the hope that by it one might prove acceptable to God. The first day is observed with the assurance that one is already accepted of God. The keeping of the seventh day was fostered by the flesh. The keeping of the first day is fostered by the indwelling spirit. Okay. Number five, the day blessed of God. Throughout this age, spirit filled devout believers to whom no doubt the will of God has been clearly revealed have kept the Lord's day apart from any sense of responsibility. To observe the seventh day, it is reasonable to suppose that had they been guilty of Sabbath breaking, they would have been convicted of that sin. Uh -huh. The day committed only to be the day committed only to the individual. First notice it is not committed to the unsaved. It is certainly most misleading to the unsaved to give them grounds for supposing that they will be more acceptable to God if they observe a day. For apart from the salvation which is in Christ, all men are utterly and equally lost. Two, for social or physical reasons, a day of rest may be secured to the benefit of all. But the unregenerate should understand that the observance of such a day adds nothing to their merit before God. Right. Second note is not to co is not second note is not committed to the church as a body. The responsibility relative to the observance of the first day is of necessity committed to the individual believer only and not to the church as a whole and the manner of its celebration by the individual is suggested in the two sayings of Christ on the morning of his resurrection. O ye, O rejoice and go, tell, this calls for a ceaseless activity in all forms a worship and service, and such activity is in contrast to the seventh day rest. No command to keep the day. 
Since it is all of grace, a written requirement for the keeping of the Lord's day is not imposed, nor is the manner of its observance prescribed. By this wise provision, none are encouraged to keep the day as a mere duty. It is to be kept from the heart. Israel stood before God as immature children under tutors and governors and needing the commandments which are given to a child. Galatians 4, 1-3 Whereas the church stands before God as adult sons, their life under grace is clearly defined indeed, but it is presented only as the besiegings, besieging, besiege, besiegings of God with the expectation that all shall be done willingly. There is little question over how a well-instructed, spirit-filled believer and the scripture presupposes a normal Christian to be such should be occupied on the day which commemorates Christ's resurrection and the new, new creation. If perchance the child of God is not yielded to God, to him, no unwilling observance of a day will correct his carnal heart now would such an observance be pleasing to God? The issue between God and the, earth, and the carnal Christian is not one of outward actions, but of a yielded life. That, that's what God really wants. Not outward actions, but a life yielded to Him. A yielded life. In terminating this discussion respecting the truth that a new day has been divinely introduced which is in harmony with the new creation and that this day celebrates the event which ushered in the new order namely the resurrection of Christ it is further to be asserted that as a new creation is one divine objective in this age, and as Israel's covenants are in abeyance until this objective is realized, it is not only reasonable but imperative that a Sabbath with all its own significance as celebration of the old order should be abrogated and supplanted by the day which belongs to the present divine purpose. This indeed is what has been divinely ordered, and the new day obtains whether a Judaized church comprehends it or not. Mm -hmm. At no point are the distinctions between Judaism and Christianity brought more into juxtaposition than in the different days they celebrate. The Jews never made choice of the seventh day. The Jews never made choice of the seventh day. It was Jehovah's choice for them. Christians never made choice of the first day. It too is the appointment of God and is observed by the church in spite of her confused mind regarding it. In fact, the covenant theologian's problem is not whether the church or the seven days should be observed. Its problem is to account for the fact that the church does observe the first day, not allowed to recognize the heaven high new creation lets it disrupt the theory of one unchangeable covenant. The best that he can do is to invest in a new day with the features of the old day and assign to the new day the inappropriate antithetical, antithetical antipodal term Christian Sabbath. Praise God. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at the ascension briefly. And you're going to be doing some research on the different topics as I give them to you. Again, the attentive student of the sacred text is confronted with 
major doctrines and age characterizing ministries of Christ, which by theologians generally are neglected to the point of dishonor to Christ. Especially is this true of those of a covenant school who, in defense of a man made theory, must avoid all that is distinctive in this age of God's supreme achievements, lest a dead level of a supposed immutable covenant should be brought to disorder and confusion. Why indeed should any emphasis be placed on the limitless achievements of Christ's present ministry, when according to this theory, saints of former ages were equally blessed with the saints of this age? I read it again. Why indeed should any emphasis be placed on the limitless achievements of Christ's present ministry? The achievement of Christ's ministry is limitless. That's what they say. All right, all right, good. So why should any emphasis be placed on the limitless achievement? When, according to this theory, saints of former ages were equally blessed with the saints of this age. You get the point now. Why emphasize the limitless achievement of Christ? Um, achievements since he, you know when you know he came and died at the Calvary and so on over and above what obtained before Christ came the order the system that was in place before Christ came why emphasize this above that that, that, that the covenant theologian asked that question nevertheless and with no support for a man-made theory the age characterizing ministries are recorded on the pages of the Word of God. It is no small issue that the present ministries of Christ, which are of the greatest consequence, should be disregarded by theological writers. No small issue at all. The unfortunate effect of such neglect is that the majority of students accept without question or investigation the doctrinal position and emphasis of their teachers. Even the teachers themselves are run into the mold of their own instructors. For this reason, there is a little hope of a new and worthy consideration or reconsideration of the interpretation of the Bible. Naturally, the student looks upon any truth which was neglected by his teacher as of no great moment or even as dangerous. Naturally, the student looks upon any truth which was neglected by his teacher as of no great moment or even as dangerous. One the lecturer neglects it. And, you know, it, it didn't have just designed it that way, you know, because <laughs> it really takes a Holy Spirit to take a student, even a graduate student, beyond that. I went to this college, theological college, and uh, well, I've been to many colleges, but I'm talking about where I did theology. Um, they brush aside the whole matter of baptism. You know, the fact that and we, I, we studied the book of Acts. The book of Acts was the course that we, we studied in um, Bible college. And watery baptism is mentioned in the book a number of times by different persons and on every occasion it was done in the name of Jesus yet it was put aside and put down as if don't go by what they did don't go by what they did you know, you know so for years after graduating from because I left um, Bible College in 1978 and this is 2000. This is 2019. 78 to 2000. 78 to 88, 10 to 98, 20. 41 years ago, I left Bible College. <laughs> and 
and it is roughly about eight years ago approximately eight years ago that the Holy Spirit really brought me to the point where I started to question because we were studying book, we were reading the book of Acts and we were preparing for Pentecost how is it and it can be a small matter that on every occasion that baptism took place as recorded in the book of Acts it was done in the name of Jesus that's not something simple That's something simple. Not something simple at all. And I started searching myself and my heart and mind and talking to God and it was revealed to me that when you say in the name of Jesus it takes in the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and I saw the passage here I don't have to go and speak at length at it because I've, I think I've done it in other courses the passage where Philip uh, in John Philip asked Jesus shows the Father and it will suffice us he said why could you ask me that have I been such a long time with you and yet you do not know me I am the Father one. Where is the Father? I am the Father, the Father in me. So the apostles were in perfect obedience. And they understood clearly what Jesus meant. When he says, I will baptize in the name of Jesus. What he said to do, they were in perfect obedience. And as a result of that, no, I was able to change it. Now, very few graduates are able to question certain doctrines or scriptures that were ignored and overlooked by the professors. So I agree with Dr. Schaefer. To many the only body of interpretation which is orthodox is that which was recovered by the reformers or is that contained in an ancient doctrinal statement. There is, however, a great body of truth which the reformers were unable to consider and which is lacking in ancient creeds. It is this which worthy expositors have brought to light in subsequent days, since these expositors are as capable in the field of analysis of revealed truth as were the reformers. The result of their labors should at least have come of some consideration. Two schools are developing among orthodox men, one which restricts all doctrine to the findings of men from the very early days of Protestantism, and one which, while accepting the sound teaching of the reformers, recognize that much added light has fallen has come about. Certain achievements were wrought by the Son of God at the time of his ascension. These fashion the doctrinal meaning of this event. In so far as human sentiment may be attributed to deity, it may be recognized as true that there was great celestial joy in heaven when the Son returned from the earth. This would have its fullest manifestation when he first returned directly from the tomb. His appearance marvelous his appearance marvelous above anything angels had ever seen. His appearance was as it ever will be the central glory of heaven itself. But from the doctrinal viewpoint the first ascension accounts for the long anticipated fulfilling of two foreshadowings of the Old Testament as well as their becoming the eternal reality which the antitypes are. Remember that antitypes mean the fulfillment of of the, the, the types. Types you know, are like shadows. right? And the antitype is the fulfillment, the real thing. So here's a shadow. You see a shadow cast either by a tree or a building. Some object. Maybe 
there's a building and there's a something an object being concealed by the building but you can see the shadow cast and it tells you that there's an object being hidden or concealed by the building the reality is the object not the shadow all right <coughs> now in as in so far as human sentiment may be attributed to deity it may be recognized as true that there was great celestial joy in heaven when the sun returned from the earth this would have its fullest manifestation when he first returned directly from the tomb his appearance marvelous above anything angels had ever seen was as it ever will be the sensual glory of heaven itself but from the doctrinal viewpoint the first ascension accounts for the long anticipated fulfilling of two foreshadowings of the Old Testament as well as their becoming the eternal reality which the antitypes are. Christ entered the heavenly sanctuary bearing only on the anti-typical meaning of the, of the Day of Atonement when all things were purified by blood and especially on the meaning of the high priest entering into the Holy of Holies and not without blood, the writer to the Hebrews asserts, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. But so when God gave Moses the instruction to build the tabernacle, to build the tabernacle, the tabernacle was a a prefigure or a shadow or a type of what really obtains in heaven. Everything here on earth is a shadow and type, you know, everything that we get from God is a shadow and type of what is in heaven. <laughs> you notice Christ likens marriage to the relationship with, with the church and himself. The marriage between a man and a woman is enlightened to the relationship with Christ and the church. So it is a is a type of something of a relationship. A type of relationship with Christ and the church. <laughs> no great difficulty arises in connect connection with the disclosure that mundane things were purified by the blood. Of this it is written by the same author. For when Moses had spoken every precept all the people according to the law he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying this is the blood of the testament or covenant which God has enjoined unto you moreover he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. It is evident that as a typical blood of beast served to purify all things of the earthly sanctuary, Christ's entrance into heaven itself, typified by the high priest entering the Holy of Holies and sprinkling the mercy seat. Mm -hmm. Come again. It is evident that as a typical blood of beast served to purify all things of the earthly sanctuary, Christ enters into heaven itself, typified by the high priest entering the Holy of Holies and sprinkling mercy seat, was in some way not fully revealed a purifying of heavenly things by better sacrifices. And is that just heaven? What you talk about heaven? You talk about the universe because the heaven, <laughs> universe, it, it purifies heaven. The universe, including heaven, is death. 
the widest range of interpretations is advanced respecting this heavenly purification, though extended the analysis of the passage made by W. F. Grant in the numerical Bible clarifies the issues in several particulars he writes and he writes we it is very very long and I'm not going to be boring with that it's very very long many pages of this quote but we're going to take a break right here because time is gone time is gone so we take a break right here and when I come back we will be having one more video but the video will not be my voice well you're going to hear from my voice but I won't be you're, I'm going to be giving you the assignments right I'll be coming back to give you your assignment for the remaining uh, this is 2016 classes enough assignment to take you for to cover the 16 classes god bless you do your reflection and email me